Welcome to episode seven of the property of the private property podcast. I'm your host, Zaman Duma Kumalo. Of course, it is day 22 of the national lockdown, and we are bringing you your daily dose of private property podcast and bringing different experts to help us in making the best decisions for our properties and for our property ambitions. Now, on this evening's show, I'm joined by a formidable, formidable woman. And you'll get to hear uh, from her shortly. Dombi Sitole is the founder of Petnini Properties. And, you know, one of the things that we'll be doing on the show beyond bringing you experts is also bringing on people who can share their property journey with us. Because if anything, we want to hear inspiring stories uh, from people who've, you know, gone from almost nothing to making quite a big dent in their property portfolios and want to learn from them, you know, find out how they're doing it, how they did it, some of the lessons that they've learned along the way. And on Fridays, that's exactly what we're going to be doing. So on today's edition of uh, how I did it, we've got Ndombi Sitole, who's going to be telling us how she went from just buying her first property to now not only owning a, uh, not only owning a building, but also having a cash flow of over 100,000 rands in her property portfolio. Ndombi, good evening. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you for having me. And yeah, here I am. <laughs> I think, so Ndombi, I mean, one of the, 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 the things that stands out for me on your story is you essentially didn't really have, you know, a property background. And I want, I want our viewers to first probably get a sense from you um, from when you first bought that prop, your, your first property in 2007. So if you can just share a little bit about your background and what prompted you to buy that first property in 2007. I, I must say my story is, is one of an accident. Uh, how do I put it? It's an accident. You know what happened? I, I, um, when I started to work in government, you know, starting to earn money that you were not used to because I was in Joburg and I was only an intern in Joburg and earning about 3,000 rand. Then boom, I come to Bloemfontein. I work in government. I earn almost twenty five thousand. I'm like, wow, this is a lot of money. So, what happens then? I started buying my own property where I live because you know the boom of have your own place to stay and don't pay rent, pay a bond, something that belongs to you. So in two thousand and eight, I bought my first property. And I, I substantially live in, lived in it. It was mine. It was my, my home. Then uh, my mother um, said that she wants to move from Elwell North, which is our hometown. She wanted to move to Bloemfontein. So now she bought a house in Bloemfontein, but she, was, she did not just move immediately. She bought a house, and then she lived in Elwell North, in someone else's house and just rented. But then there was a house in Bloom. The house was empty. So she said, don't be, you have to go stay there because the house cannot be isolated and be on its own. So there I go. And I met this other friend of mine. I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna stay in my mother's house, but now I don't know what am I going to do with this piece of property because now it's just standing there. I didn't even know what communes mean at the time. And then she just said, you know, my friend, just turn it into a commune. Mm. Okay, cool. Anyway, I turned it into a commune and I went to live at home. But funny enough, my brother was uh, at the university at the time. And he said, you know, my sister, I'm going to live there with my friends. And we're going to all be students. Like we and and we are all going to pay 1.5, and there were six of them. Mm. Um, the property was is big, it was really big, so it had two bedrooms and one lounge. But the lounge you could close it, so I just turned it into a bedroom, into a third bedroom, and then six of these guys were staying in my house. And there, I, I go, wow. And then we, they, they each paid 1.5, 1.5 across. I mean, 
there I go making 9,000 without little effort, with very little effort. And I myself was paying a bond of 3.5 and levies of 800 rands at the time. And, and, and that was it because they bought their own electricity and, and the water at the time, that's the only thing I paid in, it was part of the levies. And that's when I said, wow, wow, somebody can actually make profit immediately. Mm. This is amazing. There has to be something in this property thing. And, and Tommy, did you find when you were buying that first property, I mean, you, you were mentioning how um, you probably just didn't know much about property and probably didn't do your numbers because your intention wasn't even to turn it into student accommodation. Did you, for example, when you were buying that first property, were you already trying to negotiate the price down? Because um, you can already see these high returns. I mean, if your bond is 3.5 and the rental is 9,000, when you were buying that property, was there something in you that said, maybe let's also just negotiate the price down um, so that if one day I want to turn it into a student accommodation or rent it out, it can be lower. Were you already thinking that way? Or for you, it was just, I'm, I'm going to buy a property, I'm going to live in it. Uh, to be honest, at the time, no, I wasn't even thinking that. I didn't even know that you can actually negotiate with banks okay. to, 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 to give you a better rate. I didn't know. I just knew that you buy a property. But the, the, the nicest part was, at the time, uh, the banks were flexible with first-time buyers. So they, they financed my bond 100%, including transfer fees. Oh, nice. So the whole bond and transfer fees and everything was 100% um, financed. And to me, it was like, wow, I can actually buy something without even putting five rand in it. Mm. So now you go from, wow. you know, you go from buying a, a, a property that you're going to live in, you become an accidental landlord because your friend and your brother, you know, prompt you to rent it out to shopping for your first building. Um, how did like, take us, How did that even happen? I mean, oftentimes when people get to thinking about buying a building, they've probably bought a couple of you know, properties, they are now bullish, but you almost, you, you almost skipped a few steps and you're like, this is what I'm going to go for. I, I want oh my to goodness. No, but, the, but then, okay, after that one, I bought a second one because mm. I saw the, the cash flow there. So I bought a second one, which is the second property, which I, which I literally turned into a student home. That one I was conscious about. I negotiated yeah. price. I, 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 I saw now there's money in the state. So I, it, it was, when I bought it, it was also a two bedroom. It's an ensuite and a, and a one bedroom extra. But then I went and partitioned it to four bedrooms. And then I put students in it. So there were like six, two, four, six students in the house. And it was making almost 12,000, 15,000 at the time. So now I was actually now conscious about it. But here's the thing. The, the thing that made me want a building, I got irritated by living. I didn't know why I have to pay these levies. <laughs> I didn't understand why I should pay levies. And yeah. there were a lot of problems. This, that is not happening. Body corporate, it felt like I bought a property, but I was still being controlled by body corporate. But I, I asked myself questions. Who has the bond? Is the bond mine or that of a body corporate? Mm -hmm. I, I, I was really agitated by the idea that my property that I say is mine, I cannot do much with it unless I ask someone else about it. And the whole point is to make returns in property, not to just have a property and have a lot of things that are just as are blinding you. And that's the journey that's the, what actually took me to, to look for a building. I looked for a building. And to be honest, when I was looking for the building, I didn't, know, I didn't even know where I would get the money for it. I didn't have money. I just had two properties. <laughs> All lies. And I said, you know what? 
somebody is going to finance me. I don't know who, but we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> that you you shouldn't like the fact that you don't have you know a massive down payment ready to buy that property. Get into get in the way of you getting one. I didn't even have a down payment at the time. No, not at all. But um, my, me and my older sister, we started thinking we want to, to make extra cash because we were, we were both working, but we wanted an extra income. So we bought a tent overseas, which we imported to, to, uh, to Blue Contain. It was these nice big tents that looked like uh, a little house. So we started renting them out, but in the renting out process, we, we eventually sold it because it was not really our passion. The tent business was not our passion. And accidentally, we actually raised the funds that was needed for a down payment for the big building. And how was shopping for um, how was shopping for that building, Dombi? I mean, did you um, did you have a sense of the kind of building that you wanted? Maybe you wanted residential or commercial. Um, you know, did you want one, for example, that had shops at the bottom because then you know that's potentially extra income, or you just wanted fully you know tenant building through and through um, the size of the building? Were you already thinking about those kind of numbers when you were shopping for that first building? When I was when I was actually shopping for the building name, I I I I was conscious and I said I wanted you know I wanted a mixed use, I want to be able to 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 have the flexibility. Should mm -hmm. one not be too functional, then I can have something else that can give me money on the size. So I I wanted a mixed use. I I I actually um, at first I did the numbers adjust based on student accommodation and what it can give you back. And, and you know what, I met this, 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 this man, um, to the, the, the CEO of, of Tough. He said, no, don't you. That's not how it's done. For you, you must actually divide the, the amount they're charging you divided by the number of floodlets mm. and so that you know exactly how much you're paying for each floodlet or whatever it is. I mean, for the number of, of floodlets and, and shops that are in the building, then you get a sense of what you, you want, you're about to pay. And you must also give them the, the maximum amount you're willing to pay per flat light. And, and yeah. And and Domi, I actually just want us to to talk a little bit about TAF. Um, you know, for viewers at home who probably don't know uh, what TAF is, they've probably never heard of TAF. Uh, perhaps if you could just, you know, share a little bit about what TAF does and how they played quite an important role in, in your journey. TAF is, 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 um, is a home loan or building. I mean, buildings finance, yeah, but then they've specifically focused on the urban development zone. They do not finance out of the urban development zone, which is mainly your central business district. But if you don't know what your urban development zone is, you can just go and find out. If, you're, if the building you're looking for is within that uh, area, within the urban development zone, they, their main focus is to revitalize the CBD. Because, I mean, they've seen a lot of potential there of, 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 of income streams, especially in, 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 in the residential and commercial space. And I've seen it too with my own building because, and it, it in, in Bloemfontein, in the TAF portfolio in Bloemfontein, my, my building specifically is doing well because it, it's correctly positioned and it, it, it has tenants that are paying very, very, very well. Do you understand? So they saw their gap in there and they finance anyone with a credible 
obviously credit record, you must have a credible credit record and everything of yours should be in order and you have you must have some sort of uh, equity that you can meet them halfway with so yeah that's what tough does basically if you're just joining us at home this is the private property podcast i'm your host zamantungwa kumalo it's episode seven of the private property podcast and i've got um on the show this evening dombe sitole who's the founder of petnini properties and we're talking to her about her property journey and how she did it she went from buying her first property turned it into a commune bought a second one turned it into a commune and then got bolder and bought her first building. And we're talking to her about her journey um, in the property space and how she went from you know, just buying apartments, turning them into communes, to finally having the courage to take a bigger bite of that uh, proverbial apple. Now, Ndombi, I mean, I'd like to probably hear about some of the maybe challenges in buying that first building. I mean, as somebody who has ambitions of buying buildings and maybe even owning quite a few of them, what would you say were some of the challenges, especially considering how you went from, you know, servicing less than 20 tenants, essentially, because there was two properties, to now owning a building that you probably have to manage and their tenants at the bottom. Um, I mean, there are tenants who are your residential tenants, they're probably commercial tenants because there are shops at the bottom. What, were you, what would you say were some of the challenges that you encountered doing that switch? Um, yes. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let, let me tell you, Al, uh, there is nothing more challenging in a building that not knowing the things that make it successful. Um, when I came on from a student accommodation and a commune, that worked well because there were a few tenants. Now here I come, I come into a building, number one. Number two, I, was, I met something called construction. I've never, and, and at the time when I got, uh, because what, what, what Tuff does, it doesn't just finance the building, it finances the building and it gives money for reven renovations as well. Mm -hmm. So it gives you a holistic uh, uh, finance. So there I am, I'm faced with having to manage construction. And I knew nothing about the construction world. All I knew was how to maintain a few things, how mm. to just do A, B, and C a little bit. I mean, have people that can fix A, B, and C. But now I was faced with construction, turning everything. I mean, I had to have a proper pro project. Mm. And, a, and it was pro, it was a project it, it was a project that needed a project manager, but to be honest, I met the the worst challenges in the construction space, and to an extent that I was taken for a ride and robbed of uh, all my renovation money before the renovations were even halfway complete. And when that challenge came, it just went boom, right in your face. You have a big bond to pay, but within this big bond, there, there is also construction that is not still complete. And for that to, to, and those things now are running simultaneously, you don't have the funds anymore to continue the renovation. And the next minute, you also have a, the three months grace period that you are given is over. You have to now pay a bond. Those are the challenges that you need to look at with, with, with clear caution. Construction is the most, it's very, very, very important for you to know the basics, to know exactly what is needed and to be there and to be proactive. Otherwise, it can set you back to over a million. That is one. That is number one. Number two, the 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 most important, the the actual the backbone of 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 property itself is the property management. Mm. That is not done well. You might as well have bought a a dummy a tree. 
because property management is actually the cash flow of the business. It, 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 it's the functionality of business. It, it, the, the, it makes the business go. And, and, and those were the two areas that, that were a challenge until I, I said to myself, you know what, I'm going to start uh, teaching myself actively how to manage properties. And that is where I started building my own portfolio mm. so that I know exactly what, is, what happens in the property management space, what is important, what, what needs to be done, what needs to, to, to can happen because that is everything in a property investment. If you have any questions for Ndombi, you can ask them down below. Of course, this is episode seven of the Private Property Show with myself, Zamandungwa Kumala. And we're talking to Ndombi about her property journey. And, you know, so Ndombi, one of the things that um, I think often comes up when people start talking about, you know, buying buildings and when you bought it and value is perhaps looking at the actual numbers. Um, perhaps if you could, if you're able to share with our viewers at home, what like how much the building costs because you're saying you didn't really know much about the, the about buying a new building when you bought a building um and yet you still went ahead with it you didn't really have the equity um at hand but you still went shopping for a building almost trusting that you're going to um come up with that equity component that you would have needed what were the numbers that you were looking at when you were shopping for that building so how much was the building costing? Uh, perhaps if you could share what the what the what the building is now valued at, um, you know, sort of this year, so people can get a sense of the potential growth um, that a building, once it's been renovated and well run, um, could actually have. Um, you you know, um, where when when I I I bought bought the building, it was um, two point six m um what happens that tough does look at the numbers they are very important to them like i said paul the ceo of tough at the time uh, told me that you know what don't be that building is too expensive the one you wanted because there was one that i met before but i i i evaluated it based on the student accommodation and and how many students i can put there potentially what it could make instead yeah. of looking at the building because what they were selling me were the bricks on mortar not the tenants in it do you get it so yeah. how you evaluate it quick it's a this is a quick evaluation just divide the number of flatlets in the building with the shops and just divide that by by the amount they're selling it for that is what you're paying per flat you know yeah. And, and when we did the, 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 that quick evaluation at the time, he said, and I told him, okay, uh, roughly it would have cost 130, 140,000 per flight, you know, and, and I knew that my max, I could only go until 150,000 per flight, uh, I mean, dividing the whole thing. So not go further because you always have you need to have a ceiling because if you don't have a ceiling should mistakes happen you will not have um uh, somewhere where they they can get equity or get something out of the building because you will be so squashed in it even your tenants you'll charge them too much and end up with an empty build empty building because your bond is way too much than, than what it uh, it is positioned to make you know, because you need to know that you cannot charge cent in prices in in maybe uh, another other suburb rather than cent. And you you know, I mean that comparison. You always have to know that. So if you cannot charge maximum price that you would charge at cent, why would you buy a place at a price that where that would potentially be a problem to you? So yes, they do look at the numbers now. Very, 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 it's very, very important. And they, they also need to know how much uh, the building is going to make. Even yourself, you also need to be proactive and, 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 and push 
whatever you can push the building to its maximum income streams because at the current moment uh, I, I, I got um, I would to be able to advertise on the building itself and I mean that gives you extra income on top of what you get from shops what you get from uh, the, the residential and and uh, you know what I mean is the nicest part about building is that the income streams are endless. Um, should you have even extra funds, you, you also can tap into the electricity and water prepaid space, whatever it is, and 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 you know. But those things are extremely important for you as a a, a, a building owner to say, you know what, what can I do? beyond that, but the bond must not be way too much than what you can afford. And don't be, what's because the, I mean, if, if you don't mind sharing with our viewers at home, um, what's the current value of that building? Um, at the time it was 2.6, but the value now, they, they, they put it at 5.8. 5.8, so that's nearly double the, 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 the value. And how, after how long was that? That would be 2016, 17, four years. Four years. Because um, it took a bit long to transfer because it was under an estate late. I don't know if viewers would like to know because that also is a problem. You should, it's things that you should check. If the place you're buying is not under any state late, that could also prolong things like transfer, transfers and was taking long, it's also, I mean, the interest rates could have gone up and things like that. But yeah, right now it is. Like that. That's actually relatively in line with one of the questions that we've got. Um, and of course, if you've got que any questions for Ndombi, you can send them through and we'll pose those questions to her. We're talking to her about her property journey, how she's managed to navigate from going from student accommodation in one property, then the second, to now having a block of flats that has um, shops underneath. And this question comes from Tutuga Masek, who asks, um, how, how is your portfolio structured? Is it a PTY or is it a trust? Um, at this current moment, I have a PTY. What I do, I put one prop, the prop, every property in its own PTY. That's the journey I've learned. And then I have a trust, uh, a trust where I put the shares of the property in. If, if, if you understand what I mean, that's how I've structured it. A family trust where the shares of the property are placed in. And that's then how I've structured it. One of the questions we've certainly received quite a lot um, this particular week on the Private Property Podcast has been around structuring. Um, and I think we're definitely going to bring on a guest who looks at structuring, the different ways that you can structure that are quite creative, yeah. that can position you against any kind of risk. Because there are different ways that work for different people and which models could work for you. Uh, perhaps you don't even want to have any trust at all. You just want a PTY. Understanding what the benefits of um, maybe only using a PTY, also having a trust that you put in place um, to best maximize your uh, property portfolio, but also understand the implications of having a trust, the implications of it being in a PTY, and um, what the tax implications of that are, because there are quite a few. Yeah. So we definitely will be bringing on a guest who can help us navigate how to best structure our property portfolios so that we can get maximum value for them. Now, Ndombi, I think one of the things before, uh, you know, I kind of let you go um, is, is to perhaps if, if you were to start your property journey right now, knowing what you've learned, you know, in property in the past decade, what would you say would have benefited you in the beginning? If in the beginning I should have learned what construction is, that, 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 that's very important it's key. I should have learned what that is. Um, number two, I should have also learned the different ways to structure property because right now, the first property that, uh, that I bought obviously is in my name. And for me to take it from my name to, to, my, or to, to a PTY LTD, then I have to pay, pay transfer costs again, um, which obviously can be navigated 
because I'm busy with experts who are helping me do that. But had I known from the beginning, I would have just bought it in a PTY LTD, which I do advise. Yeah, yeah. and, and, and we've, we've actually got a, another question here from Howard uh, Mwegezane, who's asking um, if you have other shareholders, and if so, how are their shares structured, and how is the shareholder agreement? Uh, okay, that's, that, that's a, that one is a bit tricky, but of, that apparently in the PTY LTD is only myself, okay. right? But the, I own the, and from my, 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 my siblings, all three of my siblings, they are also shareholders, but then I put them rather in the, in the trust as beneficiaries and all these things, yeah. Because uh, for for me, for the for for the pe the property passion is only on me. So when I need to do something, I didn't even want to involve them too much. But then if I put them in the trust, then they are the benefactors anyway from uh, their their shares because until they invested into the 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 the, 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 the the property when we were buying and everything and when we were going down and things were not doing well they were there and they invested some of their money there my family members so Tutu has actually come back and and he he actually wants us to to go a little deeper in terms of uh when you're dealing with the late estate or deceased estate you were saying earlier that the building took a while to to transfer because of that can you just share with us you know some of the reasons why it probably takes longer or what, what you find for yourself um, in terms of some of the delays? Okay, so for, for, for my mind specifically, the, the one that I, apparently the, 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 the children um, to never resolve their estate just to avoid tax issues, I think whatever the, the, the case might be, they wanted to avoid something. So they kept the estate in their father's name, the, the property in their father's name, who passed on in 1925 or 1930, somewhere there. 1925? So now, yes, who passed on in 1925 or 1930. So they kept it. They kept the, 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 the property in his name for that long. Anyways, when it was time for them to, they sold the property, and it was time for them to actually do the transfer, it needed to uh, a real person, uh, to be, it needed to be in a real person's name. It needed to be in their names, not in their father's name. Mm -hmm. Now they had lost the ID of the father. So they needed to go and apply from high court for an ID. And that potentially took four months, five months. And after they did get the ID, then there had to be an actual transfer from the estate late to their name, those children. That had to happen. That also took long. And, 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 the whole transaction to actually transfer the property from their name to mine, it took two years. And within those two years, two interest rates, the interest rates went up twice. Mm -hmm. So what I, when I could potentially pay less amount, I had to pay, I mean, there's a bond I now had to pay on that new interest. And many other things were affected because even the transfer costs were much more than they were at the time. So it is very important to check those details for yourself so that you don't end up having to, to, to pay more than what you would have should something like that happen. And Domi, the last question for me this evening, you know, what tips would you want our viewers at home to always be mindful of on their property journey? Um, first of all, be mindful of the, 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 the actual amounts that you're going to pay. Don't sugarcoat the, 
the, the, the, the, the amount you're going to pay. There's so many things that go into buying property. Make sure that you've done your total due diligence uh, because some things just pop up. So if you, you are, um, if, if, if you are a person who likes, who, who's very proper in due diligence, ask somebody who's an expert to go and inspect the building you're buying. They must inspect it because there's things like, um, what happened to mine was I found that when I bought the building, it had a missing meter, central meter, meter box. Mm. Apparently it was stolen or whatever the case might be, but I didn't know. I, 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 when the property was transferred to me already, I didn't know that that, that wasn't there. So when I went to, 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 to send like, to actually ask uh, and to tell them the story that I bought the property like this. And this was no, I mean, I wasn't aware of this. But they said no, due to that, I had to pay a whopping 14,000 to replace that meter because it, it seemed like it was stolen. So if you can have an inspector to do the inspection of the whole building for you, before you can even sign an OTP, mm. ask for the period of due diligence so that you know exactly what you're buying. And if possible, negotiate with the, with the agency that you're buying from or the seller based on things like, I mean, based on things that may, that are like that, that just, that may have come out from the inspection that your a professional inspector could have done. Perfect. Dombi, thank you so much for joining us um, this evening. This was the episode seven of the Private Property Podcast uh, with myself, Zamandungwa Kumal. Of course, this is where we bring you different experts to help us navigate our property journey. And on Fridays, on some Fridays, we'll definitely be bringing you different people to share their property journey, share with us how they've navigated some of the challenges that they found um, along the way on their property journey, and for us to be able to learn from them um, and perhaps also grow our own property journeys if you've got of course any buying selling or rental needs you can always visit our website on www.privateproperty.co.za from myself Zamantunga Kumalo stay home stay safe and have a great weekend thank you very much <laughs>